1966, uh, March, maybe? Really? February, Mar March, 66. And how did that come about? How did you beat that? Uh, we had gotten into rock and roll because we were doing some fundraisers for the uh, San Francisco meme troupe that I was with, and we were busted in the park and we needed to raise some money, and I uh, met a lot of the musicians because we had a loft uh, on Howard Street, and a lot of the groups used it to rehearse, and the Air Jefferson Airplane was using our loft, and they had mentioned another group that they were friendly with called Quicksilver, another group called uh, the Warlocks, who became the dead, and then I went to see Quicksilver. Once I started doing more and more of these shows, I went to see Quicksilver in Marin somewhere, and uh, one thing led to another, and they and they they were on a show. I think the first show they were on with uh, the Grassroots, I think it was. And what, when did you actually personally meet John? At the same time, I suppose. Uh, I I mean, I don't remember specifically the first time, but right. I, it was uh, during those concerts, the early concerts. Yeah. Is it true that you co co-signed the loan for Quicksilver's first album? Cause on a lot of loans. Uh, I don't. I, that, that's their personal life. I. Right. But I'm not getting into that. Okay. Do you remember any funny stories? The early stories with John and Quicksilver per se. Oh, <clears throat> it's not that they're funny stories. It, it's it was getting into the whole milieu of uh, the rock scene. I was much older than most of the people. I was 35, 36 at the time. Most of these guys were in their, you know, teens something, 19, 20, 22, 25 at the most, but they were all between, let's say, 16 and 25. So I was sort of the old, the old fart in the gang. Uh, but I was amazed at what they did with some songs. They took a, a you know, take a four or five minute song and made it into a 20 minute dirge, and with obviously a lot of improvisational stuff and. Late in the evenings, uh, some of the time, uh, musicians from other bands would join the headliner, and there'd this be there'd be this potpourri of music. But those were all. That was all part of the uh, those glorious days of experimentation and discovery, and uh, there were there were no rules on how to run concerts or how to perform at concerts, and there were the light shows, and some of the musicians would have their backs to the audience for half the show and be watching the light show. And, uh, it was uh, the best part of my life. How would you describe John Cipollini's guitar? What made him different from other guitars? Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> if you can somehow guitar, if you can somehow c combine a uh, a muted trumpet and an electric guitar, I would suppose. That would be his sound. I mean, you know, obviously, he had that, his amps set up with those two horns sticking out. It was a pure, searing, uh, animal uh, uh, Spanish painting, Gothic gate sound. Very searing, very much like a. I don't know. If a stallion could sing, maybe it would sound like John's guitar. John's. John's. I think John, as an individual, because he, he was such a quiet, reserved man, visually, he has a presence in his face and his, the way he moved and the way he played. Sergio Leone missed out. Sergio Leone should have should have had him in those in those spaghetti westerns, and I don't I don't mean that jokingly. He would have been extraordinary, just like like Lee Van Cleef had that face, and also the John's music, John's playing, should have done much more film scoring than he did. How would you describe the typical New Year's Eve show in '67, '68 with the Dead, Quicksilver, the Airplane? For those times, it's pretty much the way dead shows are now to this day, and that's why I'm, I, I appreciate those shows. And I always enjoyed the Quicksilver show, it was a beautiful day, and Janice, and that whole milieu of, of uh, mid 60s music. Uh, 
I always think of dead shows as the, the title would be a Time Out World, and that's that held true for all those early shows. And if you were going back into the 60s on the New Year's Eve, it was very special to those people that, that we'd had the shows from, uh, they were 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., and after the music was done, we'd put on some silent films and turn the lights up a little bit and the window in and serve everybody breakfast. And uh, I mean, to say it's special to everybody is, New Year's Eve is always special, but I remember even early on, people came from all over, all over Northern California and from other parts of the country, and they would get together and be sure to meet on New Year's Eve. And it was very uh, fam very familial. You'd swear that they were all one family, connected somehow, cousins, married cousins, and uh, you're up in the mountains somewhere. Everybody, uh, there were no enemies. Everybody, they were all doves. There were no hawks. There were no confrontations, and people put on fine threads, and ladies fixed up their hair as a little special. Uh, and it was really a time of, it was escapism, but it was a, an attempt to express a, a hope for a better society. Uh, people started going to concerts uh, to discuss the, the wares of the day, but to have a good time, listen to some good music, sharing the good fortune of being there for the night, and uh, not not making more than that, but that was a lot. I mean, it's a lot today, but because there were no rules yet, there were no about how to run concerts and how to behave at these events. People, some people uh, made some mistake and put too much, uh, too many chemicals into their bodies and then they woke up three days later or some took a long time to wake up to reality that uh, you have to respect your body and watch what you put into it. But that was all part of the uh, extraordinary lifestyle of the 60s. And on New Year's Eve, uh, was a very, very high point for a lot of us. It was for me every, every year. It is every year still. David Freiberg gave us a really funny story about how one time Quicksilver dressed up like cowboys to play against the Grateful Dead being in. He held these guns, and I guess they were going to sneak up on him with all these guns. And apparently, there was a, somebody got murdered that night just around the corner near the Fillmore. Do you remember that night at all? No. No. So when they actually wanted to go to the yeah. film and they had their guns, these antique guns that John collected, uh -huh. the cops were there looking for these other killers oh, God. and they found Quicksilver and the next thing you know, Quicksilver yeah. was on the ground with handcuffs. Oh God. So they almost didn't play the show. There was so many, there was so many uh, I mean there's so much folklore uh, in an, our industry, especially in, the, in, the, in San Francisco. I swore a few years ago everybody started wanting to reminisce about the 60s. I mean you, you become part of history and all of a sudden you realize that we lived in the real world was history and it takes some time getting used to it. But I swore some years ago that I would never exaggerate on things. It's so easy because people want you to, did that really happen? Did they really play for nine hours? And did, she, did, did the Grace stand on her head singing White Rabbit? Did that really? And you gotta be very careful about what you really say. And I don't remember that one. I, I've heard some really good stories of various bands. I think the one I've heard most is one of the, of the Doors where I guess you're trying to, uh, Catch the microphone. I guess you caught the microphone. They had it for that yeah. a few times. Yeah, that's true. Are, are there any good ones around Quicksilver at all? Not really. Well, there were there were some. Um, there were always the tales of uh, the days when some of the musicians and Quicksilver it happened a couple of times, and I felt my job. Uh, I took my job very seriously. That uh, if I sold you a ticket, that the show should go start on time and. There were three bands, each band played two 45 minute sets or two hour sets. And there's a time uh, uh, consideration that has to be given. Well, sometimes musicians would be home or partying or whatever and come in an hour late, two hours late. It took me some years to realize that if, when I got on their case as they got out of the car, I got on their case pretty heavy and then they'd be nervous wrecks and not play as well. So it took me many years to realize I should do it afterwards. But before I learned that, I think I got into John's face a uh, number of times, uh, not one time, but I, I know that a few times uh, 
I really laid into him pretty heavy. And he's such a mild, easygoing guy. And he, it, it made me feel worse and much more exasperated because he never answered. He said, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> he wished he was more agitated, so I'd get more agitated, but he never did, which made me even crazier. But uh, God bless him. Uh, it didn't happen that often. But they were, but they were one of those, uh, you know, uh, laid-back groups, and uh, I. You know, everybody thinks that we just blow smoke and say this. They were great, and they were great. There were other great party bands, but when they were on on a, on a good Saturday night, there was nobody better than Quicksilver. I always felt my the. If I had to choose a guy to look at, who to me he he is the Marlboro man of rock and roll. That was Gary Duncan. Gary had that stance. He's another guy. He should have been in the Sergio Leone movies. He was the uh, the the guy. The he had the essence of a of a shifty rock and roller on that stage. The whole band, uh, Jim Murray and uh, Greg. Yeah. Uh, the band changed later on, you know, when Dino came in. But in the early times, uh, God, if you looked at the old posters, it was The Dead One Week, and then uh, Quicksilver, and then Beautiful Day, and then Quicksilver, and then The Dead, and then The Airplane. And we were very fortunate that we had, we had these guys living in the Bay Area, you know. And uh, I know Gary tried to put the band back together again uh, the last couple of years. Hey, Ron Pulte is still involved with the band. But John, there isn't that much to say about John because he was such a private, reserved guy. But he made a lot of people uh, very happy. And you could pick his guitar playing out. You know, it's like, there were guys that you can imitate, like Carlos. If you really know Carlos, you can't imitate him. Like, I, I know Bloomfield's work, I know John's work. Yeah, there are certain, there are certain uh, I guess, tones, phrases. Uh, and I like John because of his improvisational ability. I mean, the guy just danced, you know, and went away, to, went to another planet, came back, and went back, got back into the melodic tone. Uh, you know what? How about the trivia? You donated the Fillmore to the family for the tribute? How'd that come about? <laughs> they, somebody asked, asked and said, of course. Uh, I, I also knew, uh, of course I know his brother and his parents. Uh, in fact, uh, John's father sold me my house in Mill Valley way back. So I got to know him. Gino? Gino. Gino. Gino <laughs> And, you know, just to watch Gino kiss a lady's hand, whatever her age, and that lady would melt. Uh, so I got to know him and his wife and family pretty well in John. And I went, I visited Gino's office from time to time on Blythdale, I think it was. And they were all part of, they were all part of the, uh, by far, not just some, I'd say 65 to 75, or 65 to 71 maybe. The craziest, wildest, worst, best. But that was the height of exasperation in the beginning stages and the trial and error of our industry. But by far the best. The best, uh, accumulatively, the, the the most extraordinary ep expression of human behavior that I've ever seen. I will never see that again on, on that level. The, the adventurous aspect of the society of that time is extraordinary. Because I was, as I said, I was in my mid-30s and these people were pretty much beginning to learn how to run still. And Quicksilver and The Dead and The Airplane and all those other bands and Janice and The Charlatans and you name it, Tower Power, you know, so many 
Cold Blood, so many good bands. You miss those days? Oh, God. I, yeah. I, I, it's hard to say that I miss them because they were 20 hour days. I mean, really, I'm not one of these executives who says, well, I work 20 hour days, but I go sailing and golfing. I try to get in my my clay work. No, it was, they were 20 hour days. We'd leave, at, we'd leave at 2 in the morning, get something to eat, and get up at 7 and get back into it. But the way, the extent to which the music scene was so much part of the socio-political uh, picture of the day, the, the, the fact that there were a lot of trip outs and people who didn't do much about the world that they were putting down all the time, but there were thousands of others who truly believed and wanted to partake in an attempt to make it a better world to live in, that, that they truly believed that there was a chance to make it better and there was a lot of hope, uh, which doesn't exist today. And yes, some people spaced out and put too much shit into their bodies. But I'll never experience for the rest of my life what I experienced in the Tenderloin on a Sunday afternoon or in Golden Gate Park in a touch football in the midst of all the madness. We used to go play football and then the, sh the shows would be going on. And uh, They were, for a short time, This, this space on this planet became another planet in a sense of um, surrealism. It's very... I'll never... I know already I, will, I can't go anywhere to experience it. I know it's not going to happen again because we live in a survivalist society and we pretty much have to fend for ourselves and our families and our children and our neighbors and it's so crazy in here, we really can't, I mean, some try and to help others, but 